Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Fiona Jones from Oxford Sparks, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to another one of our live events. If you're new here, then you should know that we're hosting these every week. Lockdown down may be easing, but we're still carrying on with these throughout the summer months. So as I say, if you're new, please do subscribe, and you can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Oxford Sparks. I'm really pleased to be coming to you live. So if you do have questions during today's event, then please do pop them in the chat box because we really love to hear from you. And it's those questions that make these events really special. So uh, don't hesitate and there are no silly questions. So today I'm delighted to be joined by Russell Buchanan, roboticist from the Oxford Robotics Institute, which is within the Department of Engineering Science here at Oxford. I think that most of us have at least some mild curiosity surrounding robots, even if you're not normally a major fan of all things scientific, whether that's because you've seen them in sci-fi films or you just want to know if we're all going to be served by robot butlers in the next 10 years. So uh, maybe Russell will be able to answer some of those questions, but uh, please join me in welcoming him. Hi, Russell. Hi, thanks for having me. You are very welcome. So. Normally how we kick these things off is uh, just ask you to explain in your own words who you are and what you're up to with your research because, as always, I'm sure you can do a better job of that than me. Sure. So, yeah, my name's Russell. Um, I just started my DPhil at Oxford University um, the past October, so I'm just nearing the end of my first year. Uh, before that, I did a master's degree at ETH Zurich in Switzerland, and then before that, I did my undergrad in McGill in Montreal, which is where I'm from. Um, so I research uh, walking robots, so robots that have legs, and how can they perceive their environment and understand where they are just by touching things, so as opposed to using cameras or laser sensors. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if I can just show a video, uh, uh, share my screen, then I can give you an idea of the kind of robot that I work with. Yeah, uh, please And do. what it looks like, yeah. Brilliant. Yep, yeah, we are uh, um, sharing the screen now, so if you talk us through, then we'll, that'd be great. Sure. So, I mean, in these two pictures on the left, that's actually me uh, with our robot. Um, and we're in a sewer underneath the city of Zurich in Switzerland. And what we're doing is, uh, you'll see on the robot with these funky feet with the red socks, um, these have sensors inside of them. And then it can rub the floor of the sewer to, to, tell, to tell if there's any uh, deterioration in the concrete. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that the robot could then be used to um, inspect uh, sewers, rather than having to send a person down there like me uh, and, and do it manually. You can just have the robot go down instead. Yeah. Um, and on the right is the robot and we're inside of a, a mine and it's sort of probing this piece of machinery. So the whole idea is we want to send these robots into very dark places that are sometimes also a bit, a bit dirty. So there could be dust or fog, uh, which makes vision and laser sensors not work so well. So mm -hmm. we want them to also be able to sort of exploit the full range of perception and actually feel things around them too. Yeah. Um, maybe this has to be as like a, a backup in case the camera's not working for a bit, or maybe it's uh, because it's more accurate because it has sensors in the feet. So for these reasons, we wanna, yeah, use these robots, touch things and, and see what's going on. I'll just stop sharing. Wonderful. I love that the robot has red socks. That's brilliant. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's probably not something that people have thought about, the fact that these robots, if they're being deployed, underground really need to be able to to find their ways around um, so so that's what you're working on for your PhD can you tell us a little bit more about the um, I believe you've just published a paper on this sure so I'll just uh, I'll share again um, what I'm trying to do now is if you think of yourself a room that you know well and then you've been blindfolded you can usually reach out with your hands and touch things in the room and get a good idea of where you are in it just by touching things. Maybe if it's in your own bedroom, you'll touch your, your bookcase or your desk. Um, so we want to be able to use this in robotics. And we'll do this by first creating a kind of map of something that we know. So in the image I'm showing you, um, you'll see the robot there and it's standing in front of this sort of funky terrain. And it's something that we built and we know exactly what it looks like. It has these, uh, these chevron pattern, these sort of like angled uh, pieces of wood, and then it has these blocks and these very specific corners, and we've made a detailed map of this. And the idea is that if the robot can just walk over it, it'll feel it, and it'll be able to recognize where it is in the world, because it knows this terrain already, and then by doing that it can, uh, yeah, it can localize itself in the world. 
So what we did in this work was we had the robot walk into these four points multiple times, so in several loops. And the thing is, if you, uh, just as a person, just sort of close your eyes and try to walk on a straight line, you'll find that you very easily, you get lost. You, yeah. you don't know where you are, you'll bump into things. Um, you'll lose your sense of um, where you are in the world. But with this robot and what we've been able to show is that by walking in a loop and coming back to a familiar piece of terrain, you reloc it can relocalize. So it can figure out where it is. Ah, I've touched the, this ramp. And now, aha, now I've touched uh, this section of the terrain. And that can correct for any kind of drifting it's done in its odometry, any kind of sort of sense of getting lost. Um, and so we show this by, um, you can just see this plot here. There's a lot of crazy lines, but you just have to think of them as three different sort of trajectories of wall following the robot as it walks in loops around the terrain. So the green would be the ground truth. So we got a very fancy motion capture system, put up cameras all around, and we tracked it. Um, the purple is where the robot thinks it is sort of normally. So if you just close your eyes and you don't pay attention to any of the, the things that you're touching, you can see very quickly it, it gets lost. It starts going off in loops, and it doesn't really understand that it's face, it thinks it's facing a completely wrong, wrong way from where it is. Um, but then with our method, which is in blue, every time it comes back to the terrain, it sort of, it recorrects. It, if you look at right, right in front of the moment where, where it sort of snaps back, back to following the green line, yeah. and that's because it's sort of gotten lost while it was walking over the flat part of the ground, but then it, re, it comes back to this, this known terrain, and mm. it can fix itself, and then that's how it's continuously correcting. So in a way, yeah. this, it could just walk almost continuously for forever. <laughs> as long as it comes back to a place where it knows, it can touch and say, aha, here. Now yeah, I know yeah. where I am. Absolutely, yeah. that makes perfect sense. Yeah. So the way we do this um, is using a lot of probability and sort of um, a lot of hypotheses. So I'll just bring in this plot, this plot, and take out this one. Um, so you can see here is the robot walking once over the terrain. And what we do is every time the robot takes a step, so it's walking very slowly, it has four feet, and it'll take, we'll lift up one foot and then place it in front of it. Um, that's when we check sort of where are the feet, or where, what is their 3D position, and then we compare that to the map of if the robot were in the place where it thinks it is, how likely do these foot positions explain it? So if the robot finds that um, where it thinks it is, uh, but it measures one foot is sort of two centimeters higher, that doesn't work, doesn't make so much sense. But if the robot were slightly to the left, yeah. that would make much more sense than Logically, if you're two centimeters to the left, that should be a more likely place to be. Um, so we try to have this probabilistic model of where the robot is with a kind of cloud of points, a bunch of hypotheses that move as the robot moves. Um, and that's kind of illustrated by the many little magenta purple lines here. These are all the different hypotheses of where the robot could be. And okay. with each step, the robot then computes how likely one of these hypotheses is. And sort of the, again, the, here the green line would be the ground truth, and the blue line is the one that is the most likely. So it finds that this particular trajectory, all of the footsteps in their position are best explained, um, they, this trajectory best explains all of the footsteps that the robot has taken. So it must have gone in this way along the terrain. Um, yeah, and the, the many dots here are just the footsteps. Uh, so if, if you think of the, if you're trying to track the center of the robot, it will then have four points, which are the four feet. Yeah. Um, and they're colored uh, red, blue for left, front, back, uh, left, sorry, front, left, back, left. And then, yeah, the other two colors are for the right side of the, the robot. Um, and what it's showing is that the color, the more intensive colored ones are the sort of the more likely, the, the higher valued uh, trajectories. So they're yeah. all the ones that have stayed in the center as opposed to the ones that have sort of drifted. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so that, that's basically explaining the, the sort of background behind it. Um, and then one thing that we then try and do is, this is uh, what we would call like the, the sort of 2.5D case, because in this case, we're looking at the, the sort of X and Y position on the floor of where the foot is, but then also the height above the floor. But we've also taken this into mm -hmm. a fully 3D case where much again like the robot in, uh, much again like a person who's blindfolded, you'll want to reach out in 3D and touch your walls around you. So we've yeah. actually shown that you can do this also in robotics. So you'll see in the bottom right is, is again this sort of cloud of, again this sort of cloud, 
and the robot's going to touch the wall around it as it moves. And it's going it's, to, it, the video sped up, but the, as the robot touches, it's actually figuring out where it is. And the particles, the interesting thing to note is that um, the particles have a very elongated along a certain axis. It's because so far the robot's only touched the wall in front of it. So it still is totally uncertain about how far it is to the left or right. It only knows it's a certain distance from the wall in front. But eventually it gets close enough to this, this black obstacle and then it'll touch it and then realize, aha, I'm now also this far to the left of this thing that I've touched. See, and then the particles have sort of collapsed and then it's able to touch the point point that we told it to touch. This is sort of the example of this experiment we showed. So it's all about, um, yeah, touching things, having an idea already of what the world should look like, and then just from touching it uh, and getting this geometric information, figuring out where you must be. Yeah, that's uh, pretty much the idea of this work that I recently did. Brilliant, thank you. I think we, we just lost you a tiny little bit at the end, but um, uh, I, I think we uh, understood what you were saying and if anybody didn't catch anything then do pop it in the chat box. Um, it's really, really interesting stuff and so we were having a little chat because I looked at your paper and you were talking about how sometimes you trained the robot on 3D models and sometimes it was on 2.5D models and I was saying, what is 2.5D? Um, but as you explained there, it's the fact that you can have extra information about elevation and things like that without being a complete model. Um, so yeah, so in terms of like how the, the robot physically touches and senses the world around it, are there kind of pressure sensors on the feet? How does that work? Right, so um, generally, no, we don't have pressure sensors. In some cases, like the, the photo I showed you when I was in Zurich, we had a, a sensor on that foot, that, so that's how it measured the concrete. Measured the concrete. But for uh, what I've done in this work is, uh, is the foot is just a ball of rubber. So to actually tell if it's touching something, uh, it uses uh, basically the sensors inside the joints of the arm. So rather than actually say on our, if a human touches something, we have these pressure sensors on our skin. It more has yeah. pressure sensors in, say, the joints and would feel a force in that way and propagate that back. Yeah. Ah, oh, brilliant. That that makes total sense. Um, so, uh, in addition to that, are there any other sensors that the robot uses to, to find its way around? Um, so, also inside of the robot, so what you know, what we know, uh, what we use basically for the sensors for this is the force in the joints, but also the position. So that comes from encoders, which tells you how far the, ro has, the motor has rotated. And then that's how you compute, say, uh, where the foot is. And that's how we get an idea of um, the height of the foot and then compare that to the map. So we use uh, the kinematics or how we c calculate basically the position of each motor. Because for each leg, there are three motors. So then you have to calculate how far from each one is rotated to get an idea of where the foot is from the base. Um, the forces then come from all each of the motors also have a torque sensor. So that's how we get the force measurement on, uh, on the foot and tell if we're touching something. And then inside the body of the robot is what's called an, an inertial measurement unit, an IMU. Um, and these are pretty fancy uh, little chips that actually you find them in your phone. And this is how your phone will say, will know if you've rotated it sideways or not. Um, basically, they measure forces from gravity and can tell which way something has rotated. So we also use this to tell sort of how far the, the body of the robot is pitching or rolling around. But um, the idea being that all these sensors only, they give information about what's going on in the robot. So in robotics, we have this distinction between proprioceptive sensors and exteroceptive sensors. So exteroceptive sensors give you information about the world around you. And these are cameras and lasers and radar and all kinds of stuff. And proprioceptive give you information about the robot itself. So uh, what it measures, the forces on itself, its own rotation, um, also things like its own temperature or battery life, things like that. Really clever stuff. That totally answers my question. Um, speaking of questions, we've had our um, in from the audience audience. Um, Jonathan asks, could this type of navigation work with echolocation? Echolocation. So, right. So that this, I guess, was similar to 
say if we were to use a radar because a lot of the problems um, that I said were why we would want to use uh, because of dust or particles. Radar actually can sort of go go beyond. Uh, it's not as impeded by uh, dust or particles in the air. So yeah, definitely a radar would be sort of a, an excellent thing to go with the robot. Um, I think that there's still a lot of research in this area of how to make it work, but it would be something that could complement this kind of system. But the kind of the, the key thing though is that um, algorithm this algorithm that I have, you don't need to add any hardware to it. You don't need to add anything else to the robot. Um, so it's sort of a, this perfect backup system. Because if you imagine you want the robot to go and do some task in, an, say, an industrial setting, like inspect the sewers, maybe you will use then a radar and lasers. Um, but something could happen. And maybe uh, something like the, the sensor breaks or something goes slightly wrong and the robot can't use those sensors anymore. So you want a backup system. And the idea is that this doesn't need anything extra. If you just have a map of the world, it can sort of find its way back safely. It doesn't need to be very accurate. But a radar yeah. is also another good sensor to sort of use in these environments. Perfect. Um, really interesting. So thank you very much, Jonathan, for your question. That's great. And um, we, we've had another one in from Martin. Um, thinking about applications of these, I was just about to ask you know, what range of things do we need lagged robots for? Um, Martin asks, could this research have applications for planetary science missions? So could we be sending these um, to, to dark places, perhaps like deep impact craters um, for investigation there? Yeah, we can. So I know people working on this sort of thing. Um, they, I know, I know a lab that has come up with a walking robot that, that moves basically by jumping, because obviously on certain planets you might have lower gravity, so it takes less effort to then jump. Um, and this can be the primary mode of locomotion. So it can just jump large distances from one crater to another. Yeah. Um, the downside is that I, I think from what I know from people who work on space robotics is that they want things to be as simple as possible to reduce the chances of things going wrong. Uh, legged robots are not simple. They're very complicated things. So uh, it's a bit, it, it's an area that people are trying to go in, but it's something that uh, you need a really robust system to use. Um, but yeah, definitely legged robots are, they're very interesting because they can, they can go a lot of places that robots with wheels just can't. They can climb over things. They can um, change the shape of their body to make themselves smaller and fit inside of things. They can do, they're just much more um, diverse in the kinds of places they can go. That's very cool. Making themselves smaller to fit through something does sound like yeah. something out of a sci-fi film. So. <laughs> well, this is <laughs> what I great. did actually um, in my master's. This was a, one of my master theses was how, to, can the, how can a legged robot sort of compress its legs and like fit inside of a small space um, and I was working at that time with a six-legged robot kind of its legs splayed out sort of like a like, like an insect so it, it was very oh, wide okay. effectively and it would have to bring the legs in to fit inside a narrow tunnel yeah you, um, this, this is a bit of a biased question because I'm from a biology background myself do you ever look at actual animals obviously that's the name of your robot um, to sort of see how they function and and help with the locomotion mechanics? Yeah, this is actually a big, this is, I would say, a, a field or subfield of robotics called biomimet biomimetics, which is to, I mean, there are different ideas. There are some cases people will want to try to make exactly an animal, how an animal works, or try to make that as a robot to study the animal. So there's some work from that uses, uh, echo, that has tried to make sort of cricket robots to then study how crickets will use echolocation to sort of move around and locate food sources. And they try to make a robot move as much like a cricket as possible. But the purpose of that is to understand cricket behavior, not to sort of understand robotics. Um, and yeah. then there's the other way, which is to take inspiration from, robot from animals and use that in robots. And mm. this happens a lot too, but the thing to be careful of is to not make something very, very complex. So it's generally, mm seen as not uh, such a great idea to make a robot bird that flaps its wings because we have drones that work very well. Um, but yeah. there are other ways that so we can get inspiration from from animals, um, such as like how a chidi will bend its back to sort of then reach further with its legs. Um, I know people have looked at this and have looked at other things to sort of understand like if an animal will sort of change things about its body to, to 
than walk better, maybe we can do something similar. Yeah, that makes total sense. And uh, yeah, you're quite talking about flight as well. It, you, you don't want to be reinventing the wheel with that. But for electrode yeah. boy, it seems to make perfect sense that you would take that approach. So um, yeah, that's really interesting. And uh, yeah, thanks for everyone who's sent you keep them coming. Um, time is kind of cracking on though. So um, maybe it's time to sort of think about future stuff. Where do you kind of see this research going? I know you are fairly early on in your, your DPhil. Um, what do you expect to do over the next few years? Well, um, for the direction of this research, there's a couple of thing, a couple avenues we've thought of. Um, one thing that we have is a, with a collaboration with a lab in Poland where they have developed a method for the robot to, for a robot to uh, basically understand the type of material that it's stepping on by, while it walks. So it can, uh, based on the pressure uh, of the foot as it steps on the terrain, it can tell if it's walking on, say, sand or concrete or grass. Now, if you can use that with the algorithm that I have already, then now you can localize not just on very complicated geometric terrain, but also you can tell if you've walked from the parking lot to the lawn to somewhere else. And you can start to go in, but then you, the thing is you combine that with the geometric information. So you'll know, say when you transition from the sidewalk to the lawn, you'll see that uh, the robot will understand that it's stepped over something, but that also that now it's on grass. And maybe then it can touch yeah. other things and, and get an idea of, uh, or it, then it confuse the information to get a better idea of where it is. Um, other ways to go is to then combine this, your idea of you have a prior map with where the robot should walk. So if you're sort of a blindfolded person and you're in a tunnel, you're going to feel, you're going to stay next to the wall as you touch and walk that way. You're not going to stand in the middle and then only touch the wall when you get lost. So we want to combine, we can combine this also with the planning side of things and where would the robot then decide to walk if it has a rough idea of where it is and where are the best paths to go that give it the most information to keep it the most, uh, give it the best idea of its location. So it would stay places yeah. where there's a lot of diverse terrain and, and it would go and touch, it would reach out actively for uh, something that it thinks should be there, some obstacle mm -hmm. that it knows then would, once it touches, it can correct its uh, where it's drifted off to. Oh, it is. Yeah. That is very cool. Um, so I'm kind of getting the impression this is quite a world, would you say? Like, are there lots of people working on um, these designs at different institutions and then you pull your ideas? Um, is it quite a collaborative yeah, network? Absolutely. I mean, in general, in robotics, it's, I would say, very collaborative because uh, it takes a lot of work. It's extremely multidisciplinary. Mm -hmm. You have people who study electrical engineering like me, but also mechanical engineering, software engineering, computer science people, neuroscience people, um, you, people who study all sorts of things and so have different expertise. And you'll develop some module that you then want to add or, con or sort of stick on to another robot and then do something else really cool. So for example, we might want to collaborate with people who are designing robot skin and then put that on the robot also. And then we can, so it's, it's very collaborative. Um, also, these particular robots we use were all developed um, by a company in Switzerland, and they're used by multiple universities. So by having many universities, by many universities having the same robot, you can very easily, say, record some data with your robot and then send it uh, to your colleagues at another university. And now they can use it to do their experiments, compare their algorithms. So it's, yeah, it's a very multidisciplinary and very collaborative field, I'd say. Yeah. Oh, that's great to hear. Really nice. And yeah, thinking about how all those different elements come together from, from different researchers is really cool. Um, so, well, talking about cool, I've never introduced a roboticist before, and uh, I'm sure you probably enjoy telling people what you do. What is the coolest thing about being a robot researcher? So the coolest thing is when you get to take your robot out of the lab and go somewhere and just and and have your have it work. So I, I for example I mostly work on the software. So I will develop an algorithm, make the robot sort of uh, do something with the code. I, I'm not building anything, but then I want to take the robot and go to a mine, go to a sewer, um, go to a, 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 a an underground bunker, and have the robot do the thing that I had I had programmed it to do uh, in in person yeah. simulation, and then in the lab, and then just to see it work in real life. And to see uh, 
So all the coding that I do actually have an impact on a real moving machine in the real world. I think that's the best part of robotics. I can totally understand where you're coming from. I can yeah. imagine it's a massive relief as well when all of that <laughs> pays off. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Um, we've actually had another question in, so just to sort of take a couple of steps back. Um, this is a really interesting question. Would a robot that navigates in this way be able to figure out if the environment has changed, for example, if furniture has moved or an obstacle is introduced? That's a really good point. So in everything I've talked about so far has assumed that the world is fixed in place, like someone's bolted down everything yeah. and nothing moves. But obviously that's not the real, that's not the real world. Stuff can move um, mm -hmm. and yeah, it might change. So. In, in this case, I would want to look at probably, um, so, I mean, they asked about this current work and no. So right now I assume everything is fixed, but that's an avenue I can go down to, to try and improve things. And people have looked at this era, have looked at this idea already, usually in comparing, say, a laser with a laser sensor. They'll use that to make a map of the world and then they'll use that to do something kind of similar to what I'm doing. And what you need to do is sort of detect extreme ab um, abnormalities. You know, you have a pretty good idea in where you are. So you touch something and it's really not there. And then you keep touching and it's definitely not there. And you confirm by touching other things, good chance that the something has moved. So then you might have to then go back and fix, change your map. Or in the very least, try to relocalize somewhere that you have a higher confidence that that part of the map hasn't changed. Um, but yeah, this is a just sort of a big problem in robotics to detect special cases. Because a lot of these things are based off of sort of um, assumptions about the world that uh, aren't always true. Yeah. yeah. yeah sorry, Jonathan, and thank you for that answer. Um, yeah, it has to be very clever. I'm becoming increasingly full of respect for the robots <laughs> and the people who engineer them. So uh, <laughs> this is already great to hear. Um, one of the things we like to ask people, because we know that there are younger people watching, perhaps you want to get into this field, do you have any particular tips that you you might suggest for people who are interested in robotics? I don't know, were you one of these kids that was always taking things apart and putting it back together again? Yeah, I was. I didn't always put them back together, but I was taking a lot of things <laughs> apart. Um, I would say there's like there are tons of resources, tons of things to do if you're interested. Um, I think th there are a lot of really cool robot kits that now you can get that will have little motors, little batteries, and he'll have a, a little microcontroller, an, an Arduino, that you can learn to program, and then you can actually program it and make it spin wheels, make a little robot car. Um, so I would just sort of look for what kind of robot kit can I get. Um, there are lots of also free coding tutorials and exercises and games that you can do online. Um, mm. And those will yeah, those will give you a good idea, a good idea of sort of the tools that, that we use. Um, and then otherwise, just sort of in school, just do math and science and um, prob engineering or computer science, that kind of thing. Yeah. Brilliant. That uh, sounds like a, a really good thing to do. If you're still in lockdown, get yourself a robotics kit, you know, yeah. spend your time that way. And coding crops up a lot when we ask people this question. I think it it's such a great skill to have for so many different fields. So perhaps if you're a little bit older in school and you're looking for a new skill, then um, do check out, try uh, and do some coding because uh, very useful for lots of different things. So um, brilliant. Um, thanks so much, Russell. Is there anything else you want to to share with us as we kind of come to the end of the q and A. I I mean, you've told us loads, so it might not be. <laughs> I, <but. laughs> I guess just that, uh, yeah, I, I think robotics is just a really cool thing, really great field. Um, so I think if anyone who's even a little bit interested and you're trying to decide what you want to study or what you want to do in with your life, then I would definitely recommend robotics. Brilliant. That is a fantastic note to end on. And I'm sure anybody watching this will agree because I think just hearing about the number of applications and uh, all of the, the complexities to engineering these things has been really fascinating and something that I'm sure tons of people are now um, would really like to, to get involved with. So thank you very much. Uh, enjoyed this session, which I'm sure you have and would like to join us again. Then next week we will be joined by Dr. Pavandeep Rai and she's going to be talking to us all about drug discovery in dementia. So um, she's from the Medical Sciences Division and uh, we're going to be having a look at 
having a look at pharmaceuticals to tackle things like Alzheimer's. So please do join us for that. It will be next Tuesday, also at 4.30. So same time, same place. Do follow us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook, and that way you'll keep up to date and you'll see the links where to uh, exactly go for that presentation and the ones in the subsequent weeks. So I'm just going to quickly check the chat box. I think we've answered everybody's questions. So um, thanks again to Russell very much. And uh, we hope to be, uh, well, we hope you can join us. We won't be able to see you, but we hope you can join us again next week. So thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.